Hey, fifth graders. Welcome back to another excerpt of Nowhere Boy by Katherine Marsh. When we left off yesterday, um, we learned quite a bit about um, Ahmed and his life in Syria. So he's he's staying in the in the basement of the house in the wine cellar, and he's learning the routines of the house. But we are getting glimpses of his life in Syria, that his mom owned a parakeet, that she used to sing to his little sister. Um, and he's decided that he wants to stay. He's thinking now, maybe I could just stay through the winter right here. But he decides that he needs money and food. He'd need a cache of food. So he's starting to think about that. And is, he's remembering his dad's advice. His Baba used to say to him, um, God will, God will find a way. Let me let me find that quote because it really was beautiful. Where there is no way, Allah will make a way. So he's starting to plan that, and we also learn more. Um, so Max is learning more. Uh, he had a disastrous meeting at the Scoots. Um, couldn't pick his spirit animal, couldn't pick anything cool, and they picked Toad for him, which is a disaster. And his dad saying, Max, you got to be resilient. Like the Belgians during World War I, when they flooded their own um, fields so that the Germans couldn't um, take that away from them um, to keep it from the Germans. Um, we also learned about Albert Jonart who was a Belgian boy who hid a Jewish friend, schoolmate, Ralph Mayer, um, in his basement. And uh, the parallels between that story and current day, let's see. But, um, and we learned that El the street was renamed after Albert because he was arrested by the Gestapo and he was sent to a labor camp and he was killed. And they assume that Ralph was as well. So we'll um, be reading more. Um, you can be thinking about why that um, story will be so important to current day. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off. Chapter 11. The following day, Ahmed searched the ground floor until he found a ring of identical keys in a cluttered kitchen drawer. He tried them out in the basement door, then slipped one off the ring and into his pocket. So long as he had a key, there was no reason he couldn't leave the house. He would just be careful to sneak out when the family wasn't home and to keep an eye out for neighbors when he slipped back over the garden wall. Yikes. Risky especially with a school next door. How can he not be seen by someone? Let's see. The money problem was a harder one. He could beg for change on the street, but the idea seemed far too dangerous. The police might ask him for documents. During his search for an extra key, he'd found a couple, a couple two euro coins in the bottom of a cup of pens and pencils, but he felt a prick of conscience at the thought of taking not just food, but money. Still, the more he thought, looked the more change he seemed to find coins scouted on the mantel on the laundry room floor beneath the cushions of the living room couch the english fam speaking family seemed wealthy at least wealthy enough to be careless with their change he decided he would only take small change and always add it to the list of what he had taken so he could eventually pay them back the next day when the family was at work in school Ahmed gathered up the coins, unlocked the basement door, and slipped over the garden wall to the neighbor's yard in the street. He had borrowed a sweatshirt he'd found in the laundry pile, but he still shivered as he walked purposefully around the block and down the hill, where he spotted a supermarket. Ahmed bought crackers, tin fish, and beans. On the way back, he passed a newspaper kiosk, and before he could stop himself, spent his remaining money on a football magazine. Is our Ahmed a reader? Or does he just love sports? Hopefully, both, hopefully. Even though he couldn't read the French, he knew the names of some of the players and could look at the scores and photos. Then he scurried back to the house, his, sh his shoes squelching over piles of wet October leaves. The days began to fall into a rhythm, mornings doing various chores or talking to the orchids, the occasional trip to the grocery store, taking long naps or pouring over the football magazine when the boy came home, Nights prowling the house for leftovers or loose change. I can't believe nobody's heard him. One morning, he poked around in the packing boxes and found an inflatable camping mat. 
He imagined how much softer it would be than his blanket on the floor. It was growing colder inside, too, and an extra layer between him and the cement would insulate him. It was unlikely the family would need it, at least until spring, but Ahmed still added it to his list. That night, he started saying his prayers again, standing atop the mat and facing southeast toward Mecca. He had silently meld the familiar words with Abraham, but now he raised his voice. Hmm. Seems significant that he's praying again, doesn't it, fifth graders? Why might it be significant? Alu Hakbar, the chant coursed through him, and he remembered Bala, Baba kneeling on his prayer rug, boarded in red and white flowers in their sitting room in Aleppo. The image soothed him, as did the repetition of the words, God is greater. At first, in between prayers, he'd deflate the mat, roll it up, and hide it in the alcove but it was a lot of trouble to blow it up again. And after a while, he started leaving it out. It gave the room a homier feeling, but the chipping cement walls depressed him, especially on the days he couldn't go out. One afternoon, he tore out the posters from his football magazine, borrowed some tape and taped them to the wall. Oh, he's making it homey. The next morning, as the cat slept beside him on the living room couch and the orchid sunbathed on the windowsill, Ahmed went through the local flyers and glossy magazines in the recycling bin. Then he cut out his favorite pictures, including a superhero with a trident and golden scales and a strange drawing of a man with a birdcage for a body and added them to his gallery. The first week of November, the family went away. The cleaning woman came by every couple of mornings to feed the cat, but otherwise Ahmed was free to come and go as he pleased. On Wednesday, he discovered a halal butcher in the next neighborhood and decided to try to make his mother's kiba. Fifth graders, he's getting really gutsy about being out and about. The butcher only spoke French, but he helpfully adjusted the amount of ground lamb on the scale to the little Ahmed could afford. At the local health food store, Ahmed spent 15 minutes looking for bulgur because he was too afraid to ask. He knew he looked nothing like the mostly older European customers, but he finally found it. And without making eye contact, handed the last of his change to the cashier. Back at the house, he realized he had only a vague idea about the recipe and how to cook it at, at all, but there was no one to stop him. So he chopped and mixed, humming away to himself. He felt it was going well until a half hour later. The onions burned and the balls of lamb and bulgur fell apart in the pan. He ate the mess with a lump in his throat, oh, thinking about his mother and how he would never taste her kibba again. So he's making the, fat, the comfort food that his mom used to make for him. By the end of the week, he was relieved to have the family back, if only to hear their voices. He didn't even mind when they yelled or fought. His parents had argued too sometimes, usually when they thought he and his sisters were asleep. He remembered one argument over whether Ahmed was spending too much time playing football and not enough on his schoolwork. At least when he heard the English speaking family's voices, he knew he wasn't alone. In all his expeditions upstairs, even when the family was away, he never went past the first floor. There was something about this rule that made him feel he had an understanding with them. He didn't go into their bedrooms and they didn't go into his. So long as everyone followed his rule, he felt safe. That seems kind of ominous. It seems like foreshadowing. Let's see. Chapter 12. Max wished the fall break in Paris could have lasted another week. He had celebrated his birthday there, eating steak and fries at a restaurant near the Eiffel Tower that looked like a movie set. The city had impressed him far more than Brussels. He had particularly enjoyed walking with his dad through the underground tunnels of the catacombs, which were piled high with skulls and had been used by resistance fighters during the Nazi occupation. But now that it was a Sunday night and he was back in his own bed in Brussels, Max couldn't sleep. From time to time, this happened to him, usually when he was nervous about the next day of school. Max didn't believe in ghosts, but sometimes tossing and turning in his bed, he'd hear the floorboards creaking. Hmm. So he's not sleeping well and he's hearing this. A light footstep. He knew it was probably just Teddy Roosevelt, the cat, but he liked to imagine that the house was alive, shifting its old bones or sighing with the weight of its dark wartime history. 
Anne Frank had seemed like a story from a long time ago in far away place, but there was something about living on the street where Albert Jonart had hidden Ralph that made the war seem recent, more recent, I should say. His parents' angry whispers drifted up the stairs. He couldn't quite make out the subject of their latest fight, but he was certain it was something silly, like his mother claiming they had five extra house keys and his father swearing there were only four. These little things they're blaming on each other. And it's Ahmed. Over the past month, Max had already counted three fights entirely about bananas, which seemed like three fights about bananas too many. His father would accuse his mother of eating the last one, then she would accuse him, and on it went in endless circles that nearly Max that nearly made Max want to tromp back to the school of misery. That's how bad it was. He wanted to go back to school. That's bad. Where at least where pe when people were being ridiculous, he couldn't understand them. As the whispers grew louder, morphing into tense voices, tense voices, he overheard his mother say, we should have sent him to the American school. Max sat up, strained to hear. Give him a chance, his dad said. It's barely been three months. Did you hear him say anything yet? Come on, Michael. He's not the same kid as kind of kid as Claire, which is exactly the reason we put him in a French school. It's only November. Give him time. Maybe we should have stayed in Washington. You're just second guessing yourself. He seemed lost there. Lost there, Max wanted to shout. I'm way more lost here. He plugged his ears. He couldn't take any more. When Max finally took his fingers out of his ears, his parents had stopped arguing. But even after they turned off their lights, Max lay awake. Claire was right. He was stressing them out. And it was mo his mom he agreed with. The Belgian school was a disaster and not the kind that it just took a little resilience to overcome. Max slipped out of bed and down the stairs past Claire's and his parents' darkened rooms to the first floor. He's <gasps> going downstairs after they've gone to bed, uh-oh. He sat on the couch by the picture window in the living room and looked out into the garden. No wonder Inspector Fontaine had liked it. A misty rain was drifting sideways over the holly bushes, almost like snow. There was a strange beauty to the twisted silhouette of the leafless pear tree. A cat slinked along the wall. Max's cheeks felt damp with tears as if the clouds had moved inside. He lay back and closed his eyes. Slam. Max sat bolt upright. Oh no! Downstairs, a door rattled closed. The confusion of sleep melted away and he realized he wasn't in his bed on the third floor, but on the first floor. The rain had stopped and in the eerie silence, moonlight sliced across the living room. Max stood up breathing fast. Was someone downstairs? He crept over to the basement door, opened it and stood at the top of the stairs listening. All was silent. He switched on the light. The halogen, halogen glow settled his nerves. Maybe the noise had come from upstairs after all, just someone closing the bathroom door. He took one step down, then another, uh, until he was standing on the terracotta floor of the laundry room. There was a bang, and Max jumped as a box in the little hallway off the front room tumbled to the floor. Before Max could race back up the stairs, Teddy Roosevelt dashed out, panicked by the avalanche of cardboard. Max chuckled. So it's you, he said. The cat stared at him with his green eyes, then bounded up the stairs. Max was about to follow when he remembered the little door at the end of the hallway. He felt a sudden urge to open it and peek in. He picked up a flashlight from his father's toolkit and shifted the boxes so he could squeeze past them until he reached the door. It seemed odd that the boxes had been arranged so that the door could be opened without upsetting them. Hmm. Perhaps his parents had stored something inside after all. Curious, Max reached for the skeleton key. And no, I'm not going to be a book closer. I'm going to read this next chapter. It's one page. Chapter 13. The sound of a key turning in the lock startled Ahmed. He jerked around in panic. As the weeks had passed, he'd grown careless, sneaking around more at night, closing the cellar door a little too loudly. But no one had ever come to his home. Funny how he'd come to think of it like that. And it had seemed like no one ever would. 
But now, as he heard the lock turn, Ahmed realized that this understanding had just been in his own mind. He gathered up his blanket. The door began to creak open. Yikes. Oh, no. He dove into the alcove and squeezed himself as far back as he could. But there was nothing he could do about the camping mat or the pictures on the walls. As the beam of a flashlight passed across the cellar, he covered himself with the blanket squeezed his eyes shut and prayed he wouldn't be found. Ah, oh my goodness. And I'm going to stop there. So let me know what you're thinking and I'll see you tomorrow, sweet kids. Bye.